Does Bible prophecy predict that the Jewish people will rebuild their temple in Jerusalem? You're about to find out on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. Welcome back to His Voice Today. We are continuing a controversial series dealing with Israel issues. Uh, two programs ago, we talked about All Eyes on Israel. In the last program, we talked about Israel and Jesus Christ. And this program is called Titanic Truths About the Temple. Hold on your seats. Get ready. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, it is no secret that Christians around the world, Bible-minded, prophecy focused Christians are uh, looking to Israel, they're looking to the Temple Mount, and they are waiting with breathless longing for Israel to put down the first stone in the building of a temple which they see as uh, predicted in Scripture and uh, a temple that will one day become the center of the storm, the eye of Bible prophecy, the focus of the book of Revelation. Uh, in this series, we are examining uh, some popular beliefs, and we're taking a closer look to see what the Bible actually says. And so we're going to uh, revisit the topic of the temple. What does the Bible say? There are actually three major verses that are being used today by uh, sincere scholars, uh, prophecy teachers. They're quoted on television, on the radio. Uh, they're, they've been incorporated into books, novels, uh, television programs, and, and movies. And these three uh, proofs that are being offered are the proof texts that are uh, used to supposedly uh, support the structure that there will be, for sure, a temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount inside Jerusalem. This is uh, what we're told, something that is solid in Bible prophecy. Three texts. The first section that is used to support this uh, teaching is from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27 something that is supposed to happen in the midst of what's called the 70th week of Daniel, and we'll take a look at that in a few moments. Uh, the second text is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, where Paul talks about Antichrist entering the temple of God, and we'll look at that. And then the last section that is used is the book of Revelation and the many temple texts that are described in that book uh, that are applied to a rebuilt Jewish temple over in Israel. So let's take a look at these uh, three different areas, these three scriptures, uh, and Revelation deals with a host of scriptures. Let's go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and zero in on verse 27. Daniel 9, verse 27. This is perhaps the mother text in the Old Testament that Christians uh, interpret to predict that there must be a rebuilt temple over in Israel. I'd like to read this text, Daniel 9, 27. The Bible says, And he, and it's a controversial issue who he is, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Uh, Hal Lindsey has written a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. It came out in the 70s. It's been a blockbuster success, and there's a whole host of other books uh, out there that basically agree with Pastor Lindsay, and this book interprets Daniel 9.27 as applying to Antichrist. Uh, in verse 40, or I'm sorry, in, on page 45, Hal Lindsay talks about God's last seven years of dealing with the Jewish people, and this is how he interprets verse 27 when it says, He shall confirm the covenant. Hal Lindsay says that he is the Antichrist, and he will break his covenant with the Jewish people and he will cause the Jewish temple worship, according to the law of Moses, to cease. And then he says on page 46 of the late great planet Earth, we must conclude, therefore, that a third temple will be rebuilt upon its ancient site in old Jerusalem. The idea is that if he is the Antichrist, and if his confirming the covenant means he makes a covenant with the Jews, and it says, for one week, they, he interprets this seven days of the week to be seven years of tribulation. And if the Antichrist will do that, and then it says, in the midst of the week, which would be three and a half years into the tribulation, he, he referring to the Antichrist, according to Pastor Lindsay, he shall cause the sacrifice 
and the oblation to cease. In order for the Antichrist to cause sacrifices to cease, then they must have been restarted. And that's why Hal Lindsey says in his book, we, we must conclude, therefore, based on this text and his interpretation of this text, that the sacrifices must be restarted and the temple must be rebuilt over in Israel. Now, I, I, re I refer to Pastor Lindsay's uh, interpretation as the new, the new view or the new school. It's, it's amazing for, for Christians to discover that this interpretation, which is so common today, uh, really was not understood, at least the text wasn't interpreted that way by well-respected Bible commentators in the past, including Matthew Henry, who wrote the, the most uh, popular series of commentaries ever. Uh, Adam Clark, the British Methodist, he had a different view, and so does the Jemison, Fawcett, and Brown commentary, and so does this book that I've mentioned before in previous programs called Christ and the Antichrist. This book came out uh, many, many years ago. It came out in the 1800s, 1846. It has a series of endorsements at the beginning here from people like Moses Hodge, who was a Presbyterian pastor, uh, Robert Howell, who was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, Edward Wadsworth, pastor of the Methodist Episcopal Church in Virginia, James B. Taylor, the corresponding secretary of the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention in Richmond, Virginia. And they all endorse this book, and this book takes a very different view of Daniel 9.27. It refers to the 70th week, that last seven years, and on page 47, it says, sometime during that remaining seven years, Jesus was to die as a sacrifice for sin. Here are allusions to events so palpable, palpable that one would think that the people among whom this prophecy occurred could not possibly have misapplied the prophecy. This book says the 70 weeks of Daniel are in the past, centuries ago. We are not to look to the future for the fulfillment of these predictions. We must look to the past. And if to the past, where is there one who can have any adequate claims to being the subject of these prophecies? Only Jesus. He and he only can claim them, and to him they most certainly refer. This book and many other books, the old school, interpret the Bible this way, that when verse 27 says, he shall confirm that he is Jesus Christ. And the context of verses 24 to 27 focus on the Messiah. Uh, the word Antichrist is not mentioned in this text. They, the old school interprets the 70th week of Daniel as following the 69th week, that when the prophecy says there'd be 70 weeks, we have that 70th week, which is understood as seven years, which I agree with, it is seven years, but is that seven years in the future, or did the seven-year period of Daniel 9.27 occur in the past? Uh, the old school says that the 70th week follows the 69th week. He shall confirm the covenant. The word confirm is used by Paul in Romans 15, verse 8, that says that Jesus will confirm the promises made to the fathers. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. The words covenant and many are the exact words that Jesus Christ used the night before he died. In Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus uh, broke the bread and passed out the juice, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus were, used the word covenant and many. And it says he would do this for one week and in the midst of the week, which would be three and a half years in, and Jesus' public ministry was exactly from his baptism to his death, three and a half years, it says, in the midst of the week, he would cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And the old school understands this as applying to Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, which put an end to the sacrifices of the Jewish temple system. They were no longer of any value when Jesus died. He's the great sacrifice. And then in 70 AD, when the Romans came and destroyed the temple, the temple was uh, burned to the ground, and the sacrifices have never been restarted because there isn't a temple over there. And so Protestant scholars of the past have understood Daniel 9, 27 as applying only to Jesus Christ. And it makes sense when you think about the whole issue of the sacrifices. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says that Jesus Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Only one. There would never be any more sacrifices. Uh, in Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 1, 
the Bible talks about the Old Covenant sanctuary and the temple service. Uh, and then in chapter 8, verse 31, it says that that old temple service was getting ready to vanish away. And it did vanish away in 70 AD when it was destroyed by the Romans. Now, now think about it. Uh, let's just say that the Jewish people did rebuild a, a temple over in Israel. And, and let's say that they did restart sacrifices. What would the reinstitution of those sacrifices be saying to God? What, what would it be saying to Jesus Christ? Could the Lord bless such an endeavor? Well, according to the Bible, Jesus offered one sacrifice forever. When he said, it, it is finished, it was done. And if, uh, if the Jewish people rebuild a temple and restart sacrifices, those sacrifices would be a, a public, official, and open, and obvious, and blatant denial that Jesus Christ was the final sacrificed sacrifice who died for the sins of the world. Uh, could God bless the reinstituting of sacrifices that ended with the death of his son? The, the answer is obvious. He could never bless such an endeavor. And so primary argument, primary argument number one from Daniel 9.27 where this verse is interpreted that he would cause the sacrifices to cease this is applied to the Antichrist in the future during a seven-year tribulation. Uh, to me, the evidence just doesn't fit that view. Uh, I believe in the old school, represented by this book, represented by Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, Jemison Fawcett and Brown, uh, scholars for hundreds of years who have interpreted this text as applying to Jesus Christ, who confirmed the covenant, uh, and especially in the midst of the seven years when he died on the cross and put an end to all sacrifices. So if you understand this text that way, and if you understand that the 70th week logically follows the 69th week, and that this is history centered in Jesus Christ, then uh, the, the first argument, of Daniel 9.27, supporting the concept of a rebuilt temple over in Israel, uh, that, that argument just really doesn't it doesn't work. So that's argument number one. What about the second one? What about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 finds Paul talking about the coming of Antichrist and about the Antichrist entering the temple of God. Now let's take a look at this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Paul said, we beseech you, brethren, he's writing to the church, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, when Jesus will come, and by our gathering together to him, Jesus is going to come down and he's going to gather his church from around the world. Verse 3, Paul says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, referring to the day when Jesus will come to gather his people, that day will not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So here's the text. Uh, Christians today often look at this verse and say, well, look, Paul predicted that this man of sin would enter into the temple of God and he would show himself that he is God. And they interpret this text, they say, see, there's got to be a temple over in Israel for the Antichrist to walk into and show himself that he's God during the seven years of tribulation. But the question is, is that really what this text is saying? Uh, again, I refer to the view that I just shared as the new view. Uh, believe it or not, there is another view view, there's an older view, there's an ancient view that was taught by many, many, many Protestant scholars uh, for hundreds of years. I've got in my hands here a book called Romanism and the Reformation, written by a man by the name of H. Graton Guinness. Uh, Guinness has been dead for a long time. He wrote this book in the late 1800s, in the 1890s, or at least that's when it was published. He has been uh, called England's greatest Bible prophecy teacher ever. And in this book, and I've read it cover to cover, uh, he agrees with Charles Spurgeon 
uh, the great Baptist pastor in London. He agrees with um, John Calvin, who wrote the Institutes, who started the Presbyterian Church. He agreed with uh, John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church. Uh, in Wesley's uh, comments, he talked about Second Thessalonians chapter two. He he agrees with uh, Matthew Henry, the great the great commentator, who in Second Thessalonians chapter two had a very different view of the temple, what this means. Now let's just take a close look at it and see what Paul is really talking about. In verse 3 he said again, let no man deceive you by any means for that day will not come except there come a falling away. First, uh, the expression falling away, the Greek word is apostasia, which means that there would be an apostasy or a falling away from Jesus and from Bible truth that would happen in Christian history. And this would happen before Jesus comes to gather us. He says there would be a falling away first and that man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition. That man of sin is a reference to Daniel 7, verse 8, where Paul talked about a little horn rising out of the head of a beast who had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And it says that that man of sin would oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God would sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. The word for temple, the Greek word, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand the Bible but sometimes it's helpful. Uh, the Greek word that Paul used here is, uh, was naos, N-A-O-S, naos, for temple. And when Paul used that word in his writings, he never applied it to a literal rebuilt temple over in, over in Israel. Let me show you how he used that word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul is writing to the church of God. And then in chapter 3, verse 16, writing to the church, Paul said, Know ye not that you are the temple of of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So, and the word he used here was naos, that the church is the naos or the temple of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul used the word again. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, Paul's writing to the church, 21 and 22, and he said that you as a church in whom all the building is fitly framed together, it's growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. So here we've got the word temple applying to Christians who are being built up into this temple, and the Greek word there that Paul used for temple was naos. Naos. Uh, and he was applying that to the church. Guinness, in his book Romanism and the Reformation, has a whole section on the use of this word and the Antichrist coming in to this, to the temple of God. Let me see if I can find that quote. Here it is. Page 49, Paul talks about the son of perdition, which is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, which is a, a term that Jesus applied to Judas. Uh, in John 17, 12, he referred to Judas as the son of perdition. Judas was an, an insider, a disciple who betrayed Christ with a kiss, and Guinness applies the son of perdition uh, to a secret enemy who seems to be a friend, a familiar friend, yet a fatal foe who betrays with a kiss and says, Hail Master. And then he goes on and says, Observe the place occupied by the man of sin, which is the temple or the house of God. Guinness says, This is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. Paul, who uses this expression in his prophetic portrait of Romanism, employs it both in Corinthians, which we've seen, and Ephesians, which we've seen, with reference to the Christian church. To Paul, emphatically, the temple of God was the church of Christ. This is the temple in which his prophetic eye saw the man of sin seated. It's a fact that Protestant scholars, uh, Luther, Calvin, Huss, Jerome, Wesley, Spurgeon, the list goes on and on, uh, Jemison, Fawcett, and Brown, Adam Clark, uh, Matthew Henry's commentary, all applied, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, to a falling away and to the development of the papal power and to an apostasy centered in, in Rome that was centered in a man, in the leader of the Roman church, who 
brought his uh, traditions and his theories into the temple of God, which is the church, bringing uh, traditions into Christianity, uh, just like uh, Judas betrayed Christ with a kiss. So this is someone that claims to be a friend, but actually leads away from Jesus and from solid Bible truth. That's the way they understood this prophecy. I'm not creating something that uh, isn't real, but this is a fact. Study history. Study the Protestant scholars. They all applied 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the temple of God to the church, that apostasy and corruption had come into as a result of the papal power. Now think about this. Paul said that the Antichrist would bring his, his um, deceptions into the temple of God. It's the temple of God, Paul says. If the Jewish people ever did rebuild the temple, I just about, I like talked about the sacrifices, if they rebuilt, if they restarted their sacrifices, could God ever bless those sacrifices uh, since those sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus Christ? Definitely not. And if they rebuilt the temple and restarted sacrifices, think about this. Could that temple ever legitimately be called the temple of God if that temple by its very nature and the sacrifices by their very nature are an actual denial of Jesus Christ uh, and his death on the cross. It's impossible. Uh, if the Jewish people did rebuild the temple, it could never be called the temple of God because its sacrifices would deny God's own son. And so based on that and based on all the research that I've done, uh, it just doesn't make sense that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 would be applied to a rebuilt temple, especially when the Greek word naos is always applied in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and uh, Ephesians 2.21 and 22 to the Christian church. So that's argument number two. We've looked at Daniel 9.27. We've looked at uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Now the last basic argument is based upon a series of texts which is in the book of Revelation. And I call them temple texts. Temple texts in Revelation. The temple is mentioned many times in Revelation, it is true. But if you look carefully at these verses, uh, honestly, and I've done this many times, you'll never, find, you'll never find one text in Revelation applying to an earthly temple. Not a one. Uh, Revelation 11:19 talks about the temple of God, which was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there are lightnings, voices, thunderings, an earthquake, and a great hail. So here is the temple of God, but it's up there in heaven where Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Revelation 16, verse 1. John wrote, I heard a great voice out of the temple, and it's the temple up in heaven, saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 16, verse 16, which talks about the battle of Armageddon, describes how he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The very next verse says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice, a booming voice, out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And then all these things happen on the earth. There's a huge earthquake. Uh, the cities of the nations crumble. The, the mountains sink. The islands disappear and great Babylon is destroyed at the end of chapter 16. And so when you look up the word temple, uh, another text in, in the book of Revelation, also chapter 15, verse 5, says that after this I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Revelation 11:19, 19, Revelation 15, 5, Revelation 16, 1, Revelation 16, 17, all of these verses apply to the temple of God in heaven. And it's significant that right after the word Armageddon is used in chapter 16, verse 16, then the voice of God thunders from the heavenly temple and says, it's done. The focus of revelation, the focus of uh, the conflict that leads up to the battle of Armageddon is not an earthly temple. It's, it's uh, Jesus Christ and the forces of God against the forces of the devil and the forces of God are centered in Jesus Christ as our great high priest and in his work in the heavenly temple and in his ministry to cleanse us from our sins by his blood. And as Hebrews says uh, in chapter 8 and in chapter 10 about the new covenant, Jesus wants to write his law in our hearts. And this is the work that God is trying to accomplish to prepare us 
for the return of Jesus Christ. So, Titanic truths about the temple. Daniel 9, 27 really doesn't support a rebuilt temple theory because it applies to Jesus Christ and what he did in the past when he died on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 talks about the temple of God, which doesn't apply to a rebuilt temple because God's temple is his church, and we must be on our guard against deceptions that Satan is trying to bring in to the church. And in the book of Revelation, the temple over and over again is always referred to, always referred to, as the temple of God in heaven, where Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Uh, on April 10, 1912, the Titanic set sail on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic from England to New York. Uh, nobody expected that she could sink because she was considered unsinkable. But she did. She hit the ice. Uh, she went down approximately 2,200 passengers still on board. The unsinkable Titanic ended up at the bottom of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we must beware of doctrines that may consider themselves unsinkable. But when we really study our Bibles carefully, they just aren't there. May God help us to study Daniel, to study Revelation, to study the New Testament, to focus our lives on Jesus Christ, uh, not to be led astray by fables, but to follow the truth only of the Word of God so we can be prepared for His return. You have just heard His voice today.